Hello, this is Dr. Avent Holt for Sociology 1101, and we're starting our unit uh, on socialization and asking the question of how it is that we come uh, to be what we all consider to be human. That is, how do we come to understand things like uh, culture, uh, our social roles and norms, and those things that, that sort of make us uh, uh, human in a, in a certain sense, in the sense that we think about human. Where do we learn all of these things and how do, how do we acquire them? And so to do this I'm going to actually lay out three different cases that I think help us try to make sense of, of or come to some understanding of, of that question of how it is that we become human. And so what I'll do is lay out those three cases um, and raise some questions around them and then at the end of this this presentation I'm gonna gonna provide you with a big question that you're gonna write for your uh, fourth it is now writing assignment okay so the first case that I'm gonna lay out is a, a <clears throat> really a set of cases or, or uh, certain set of cases that you've already read about on feral children and so when we talk about feral children what we're talking about are children raised outside of human contact so children who've been in some ways abandoned um, and yet have survived um, and some of the, the sort of more uh, or quite horrific cases been sort of locked away inside of basements or rooms uh, basically with no contact with other human beings right and so you read about several of these cases um, the first case uh, the first documented case that we have for this uh, of a feral child uh, comes from the 1790s in France where a quote-unquote wild boy was found in this in, in a town in France uh, and <clears throat> was basically put on display for the town to see and so so one of the things to understand is that in, in this time in France uh, there was the idea of the quote-unquote noble savage and this is an idea that comes from a French political theorist Jean-Jacques Rousseau who uh, I won't go into to the full details of, of his argument uh, that human beings if they were uh, able to exist and when we did exist outside of what we could call civilization uh, were noble we're, we're good people we're sort of good by nature in this sort of sense and we're better human beings right and so people had this idea of a noble savage um, and so they took this wild boy, this feral child, and basically put him on display in the town. And so people came all uh, from all around to see this, this quote-unquote noble savage. And when they got there, instead of seeing what they thought of a noble savage, they saw uh, basically a boy who lacked any uh, social skills and lacked any resemblance to what they understood to be human. He grunted like an animal. Uh, would eat filth and anything that was around him, uh, smelled, was unclean, uh, uh, would kill and eat small animals when, when he saw it go by. Um, and so this was not at all the kind of image that, that uh, French folk, folks at the time had of what a noble savage would be. However, a well-known expert uh, uh, named Pinel declared that the boy was an incurable idiot. Right, said that this was uh, basically something was defective about this young boy um, uh, and he was uh, uh, to be sort of treated as, as, as an incurable idiot. And instead, however, uh, a physician by the name of Jean Etard argued that the boy was not uh, naturally uh, uh, an idiot and not naturally this way, but, but that the boy uh, was a result of uh, the, uh, his social conditions that what we were seeing this this uh, wild boy was a result of the lack uh, of <coughs> uh, some kind of social interactions and so Jean Etard took the boy in spent five years uh, kind of working with him trying to develop uh, him uh, in some ways and after two years uh, in the place of, of this uncivilized wild boy uh, we had something that was almost like a normal child uh, but a normal child who could not speak right uh, he became clean, was actually affectionate uh, towards uh, others, especially Atard, and was evil, even though he wasn't unable to speak, was able to understand what was said to him. S much of his senses, his sense of smell and touch and so forth, were, were improved and developed. Um, and, so, uh, and, and so in some ways, uh, he actually became much more like a young boy 
uh, than when uh, they had found him. Now, one of the things that I want to, or one of the questions that I want to raise out of this, um, when we think about these feral children, such as the young boy in France, um, or, 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 or Anna, or the others that you read about uh, in today's reading, it leads us to ask the question, what is, what is missing right, in their, their lives that leads them to become so different from us? Why, what is it uh, that feral children are missing uh, that lead them to look so markedly different from the rest of us? Right? So I want you to, to sort of hang on to that question uh, for a few minutes, while, and we're going to talk about the next case. So the next case that I want to talk about um, is a set of experiments uh, done in the 1930s by two psychologists, H.M. Skills and H.B. Dye, um, uh, in orphanages. And so one of the things that as Skills and Dye were looking around, and others had noticed this as well, is that children raised in orphanages displayed very uh, low IQs, markedly lower IQs uh, than children outside of or orphanages. And some uh, uh, psychologists and others looked on at these cases and said that there must be something different about these children, that they're, they're kind of naturally unintelligent. Uh, the parents of the kids who, who, who uh, uh, end up in orphanages must, not be, uh, must have lower IQs as well. Uh, something about these kids is, is, is wrong. Right? But Skills and Dye uh, uh, suspected there was something else going on, and in particular suspected that there was something about the social environment that mattered. And so they decided to see if, they could, if there was a way they could test this idea to see um, uh, 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 if it was the environment or if it was something about the children themselves. And they did this uh, uh, in classic experimental fashion by randomly selecting 13 infants from an orphanage in Iowa, all of whom were around uh, 19 months old, and they placed them in, a, in an institute for mentally disabled women. Now, the women in this institute ranged in ages from 18 to 50, but were all uh, uh, diagnosed as being uh, mentally at the age of between 5 and 12. Right? So we've got 13 infants that are taken out of an Iowa no orphanage and put in this mental institution for disabled women, leaving a control group inside of the orphanage of 12 infants, infants. And so after two and a half years, they went back to each of these sets of children and they tested their IQs. And they found that those who were uh, raised in the, the mental institution uh, actually gained 28 IQ points uh, over the two years that had lapsed, while those who were left at the orphanage actually lost 30 IQ points. They then followed these kids all the way through their, adult, uh, through their lives into adulthood, and by adulthood noticed that those who were raised at the mental institute had completed uh, higher levels of education, 11 of the 13 had gotten married, and all of the 13 were self-supporting adults. In contrast, those in the control group averaged less than a third grade education. Only two out of those 12 uh, were married. Uh, and four of them were still living in a state institution. So here's the question. What was different about the treatment group? Think about their social conditions. We've got one in an orphanage in an orphanage in Iowa, an orphanage in Iowa. Uh, and then we've got the treatment group that has been placed inside of a mental institution and basically being cared for by uh, these uh, mentally disabled women from ages 18 to 50. So what is it that might be going on uh, that's different there? All right, so now let's turn to our third case to think about. So this, the third and final set of cases that I want to, or case that I want to talk about comes from a set of, another set of psychologists in the 1960s, Harry and Margaret Harlow. Uh, who conducted some experiments on rhesus monkeys. And rhesus monkeys are interesting and important here because they are um, uh, fairly close relatives of ours in an evolutionary sense. And so what they did, they took uh, rhesus monkeys and they raised them uh, essentially in isolation from their parents, uh, or from their, from their mothers, most importantly. 
Um, and they gave them each, each of these rhesus monkeys in isolation, two mothers, one of whom uh, uh, you can see pictured here, one of whom uh, was uh, made of a terry cloth fabric, and the other of which uh, was a wire cage uh, without the cloth fabric over it and just had a, a bottle of, of milk uh, with it right, from which they could drink. And then they would, uh, this is actually quite uh, terrible <laughs> and maybe unethical. Some have argued it actually is unethical. Uh, they then scared the baby monkeys with a mechanical bear or dog um, and looked to see what, uh, where they would run to. And it turns out that all of these uh, baby uh, rhesus monkeys, instead of jumping to the wire, uh, uh, the, the wire uh, 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 frame with the nipple uh, on it, they all jumped towards the wired frame with the terry cloth, uh, quote-unquote, mother around it. Right? Uh, so rather than going to the source of food, uh, they went to the source of a kind of intimate physical contact that they get. That's something that you might think of as being a kind of warm, cozy, fuzzy thing uh, to grab towards. Now, um, uh, so that's an interesting finding from the studies, but then they also took these monkeys uh, later on and introduced them into uh, 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 monkey groups uh, that had been not been raised in isolation, but that were, were, were essentially raised in a, in, a, in a standard monkey fashion, if you will. And when they, so when they later placed them with these real monkey groups, they found that they were completely unable to participate in uh, these, these group settings. They couldn't engage, uh, could not figure out how to adequately engage and play fighting. Uh, the other monkeys uh, would reject, eventually rejected them. They couldn't even figure out uh, how to have sexual intercourse with other monkeys. Right? And so <clears throat> they were basically unable to engage in any kind of group activity uh, with other monkeys. Right? Uh, and then there was a set of these monkeys as well that the Harlows actually impregnated, um, uh, even though they couldn't have sexual intercourse, so the Harlows actually impregnated them uh, to see what they would do, and they found that they could not effectively mother their own children. They kicked, struck, and crushed their babies uh, on top of the cage floor. Um, so, here's the question. Why were these monkeys raised by the wire mothers unable to interact with other monkeys. What was going on here uh, that led them to be unable uh, to participate in, in, in group life? Okay. So we've gotten kind of three questions uh, out of this, uh, out of these, these three cases to think about. So what I'd like you to do uh, is for your fourth and final, uh, or for your fourth writing assignment, um, so I want to think about these three cases and think about the questions uh, that we've posed. Okay. Why is it, uh, what is different about these feral children that makes them look uh, so much markedly uh, more different from uh, the quote-unquote normal child and child uh, in development? What is different about those children who are raised in orphanages relative to those who are raised in the mental institute? Uh, uh, with uh, being cared for by those uh, uh, mentally disabled women. And what is it, what's going on uh, for these monkeys who were raised by wire mothers? What are they missing that makes them so different from other, uh, from other monkeys? So, so think about these three cases and ask yourself, what is it uh, that's going on? What are these, what are these individuals uh, that seem to be turning out so poorly um, what are they missing and why does that matter? Why is that producing uh, the particular negative outcome here? Um, what would be different about their lives in, in another sense if they, uh, <coughs> if they had not been raised uh, in isolation, uh, away from other human contact or in, inside of these orphanages uh, or away from uh, uh, their mothers and with these wire mothers? What's going on there? So think about that. Uh, you'll spend about uh, a, a page or so writing a, uh, an answer to that question, a pair, somewhere between a paragraph and a page, whatever you think is appropriate, uh, no more than a page, trying to flesh the answer to that question out. And then we will talk about that uh, when we get back together on Thursday. I'll see you all then.